Hey everyone, welcome to JLXP, otherwise known as the Josh Leesman Experience. I am Josh Jat Leesman, and this is actually the type of show I've been thinking about for a while, where I can hopefully talk about a wide range of topics with a lot of different people and really try and grow the overall conversation as well as share my thoughts on pretty much anything. So throughout the season, I'm hoping to get out multiple episodes a week about the LCS, the patch, new champions, past League of Legends games, or just kind of random thoughts. If I feel like it's an interesting topic or conversation, then I'm hoping to be able to talk about it on the show. But for this episode, episode one, I've been doing a lot of prep thinking about the upcoming LCS season. And rather than doing one gargantuan four-hour episode that tries to preview every single team, I wanted to break it up a little bit. I've lined up a bunch of different guests to talk about different teams, and we're going to tackle the teams one at a time. And before I forget, we're going to try and make this podcast available in as many places as possible. For now, you should be able to find it on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or YouTube. The iTunes and Spotify might not be up right away, but expect them to be there recurring going forward. So if you want to like or subscribe, you should be able to get every new episode kind of wherever you want it. If this ends up getting posted to Reddit, I'll make sure to read the comments, check out the reactions. Otherwise, let me know what you think on Twitter. I'm Riot Jat there, or I'm Esports Jat on Instagram. So without further ado, episode one, I have Mark Z on to talk about Team Liquid, and then I have Freak to talk about Golden Guardians. Two teams who, from the looks of it, have vastly different expectations for 2020. We're going to start with a history of where these teams came from and then talk about where they're going in 2020. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back, everybody. I am currently joined by Mark. We're here to talk about Team Liquid, the four-time LCS champions, as Flower said, back to back to back to back. They need one more back for all five players, and then they yeah. can then they can do make like, a weird yeah pen. like the whole back to back to back like whenever someone three peats it's because you don't want to switch from the back to back term to three peat because I feel like you can't go beyond back to back because your back is next to another back it breaks down when you start yeah trying like, to imagine what it back looks like to double back it just doesn't like sure it's back triangle anyway yeah. uh, <laughs> we're gonna talk about uh, Team Liquid as they move into 2020 but also something I wanted to do with this series is bring in different voices to kind of give opinion on different teams. And you used mm -hmm. to work with Team Liquid in the dark ages of the franchise. You want to talk about that a little it bit? It wasn't quite the total dark ages. I think Okay. I think 2012, 2013 was the true dark ages. Okay, so 2012, 2013, there was still Curse. Yeah, so in 2014, it was Curse as well, and that's when I joined. Mm -hmm. uh, 2012, there was no LCS. But it was Steve as the owner. Steve, Steve was the owner... Starting and starting support, but only starting in 2014, actually. Okay. So, this is probably getting too much history for people, but it can be quick. This it it just... can be quick. All right, so 2012, no LCS, mm -hmm. but there is a curse. 2013, there's an LCS, and curse is still owned by Curse the Company, I believe. If yeah. I'm getting this right, I think so. Uh, and this is the dark age with Marn and all those velocity and those, yeah. When LCS was founded, they did the big, I called it like it was the expansion, it wasn't the expansion tournament, but it was like the LCS qualification tournament because yeah. actually. I think only three teams pre-qualified for LCS, and then there was a five-team the team qualifier. Yeah. yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, and, and Curse dominated that. Mm -hmm. um, they they were pretty good that season, but I think fell short right at the end. Uh, yeah. And then I, I think what happened was Steve bought the team, mm -hmm. but they had to qualify back in. I think they, they busted out at the end of summer. Because I remember when I joined, we were in relegations, and we had mm -hmm. to play to protect our spot. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was when I joined was between 2013 and 2014 right. when they were relegated and we had like Void, Dom, and it was like the whole new team. Dom was coming back from getting banned and Steve had just bought the team. that He like, yeah. they still were titled Curse, but he now owned the actual team. Yeah. Uh, so that was like what I joined and that was a mess. <laughs> like League then, like, oh boy. Uh, some horror stories are like, right when I joined, the idea of like not being on YouTube or things during mm -hmm. practice was like surprising, you know, like <laughs> in pick ban, I was like, well, even the idea of like, pre like setting up pick ban, you know, I was like, right. Hey, let's talk about what we want to practice today. And yeah. Cause like, you told me sometimes even at the start of the week, 
doing pick ban on a Monday and saying, nope. hey, this is maybe what we should prepare for since we're only playing two games this week. Yeah, sometimes four was Super Weeks back then. Five. Yeah. Or yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There were five game weeks with Super Weeks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So like it was just a mess, you know, like no one was like you had like uh, analyst then was basically like post and that was it. And we, mm-hmm. we tried to structure a little bit more, um, uh, but it was it was a nightmare. And then I think we went too far the other direction in season five where we tried to be really structured and mm-hmm. Steve tried to do like that whole living area, working area, and we got an right. office. Yeah. But it was like in another office complex. We were like subletting, I guess, like basically a closet. So we were yeah. all like back to back, tiny room, no ventilation, sweating. Yeah. We had one little other room that was like the VOD review room. Yeah. That was a nightmare. That was like the precursor to the Alienware training. Yeah, facility. it was just like we didn't have the budget probably yeah. to do what we dreamed up. So mm-hmm. instead of just saying, ah, let's wait, <laughs> we just did a really crappy version of it. Um, and that's actually the last season I worked with them was 2015. And that was yeah. for the first year they were Team Liquid. Uh, they they merged with the actual Team Liquid. Yeah, which they, was uh, StarCraft Org and other esports. Yeah, they had and, websites yeah. and it was Victor uh, yeah. was, was the owner of that. And then I was there for a lot of 2016. And then yeah. I left right at the start of 2016. So yeah. like I went, I was there the whole off season, and I I, I left and went and joined the academy team to just kind of yeah. like mess around until I actually quit. Yeah, and then they got good. So that's <laughs> a, apparently our our producer Dave thinks yeah. that that's the timeline. I don't know if people remember. They got something. like the anti Mark jump. Like your well, your presence was no. That's there was a the 2016. <laughs> Spring, where it was like, hey, this is kind of working. Dardock's a beast. Piglet mm-hmm. and Phoenix still got it. Uh, Lorlo was, was pretty good. It was the year of Lorlo, as you guys were all pushing. Yes, <laughs> I, I kind of remember that. So, yeah, just it's. I think it's important to do a brief bit of history with Team Liquid because I never know for sure how long someone has been an LCS fan. Because if you've only been watching LCS for the past two years, you've seen... Steve Money ever. Memes, this well-run organization with tons of funding, four straight championships, most dominant team ever. But the time you were with them, it was rocky up and down. There, there was times where you were a double TP play away from making finals. If you remember, there was a CLG versus TL game where two teleports happened on the same minion at basically the same time. Yep. Surprise, Piglet, he died. Game over, series over. Well, I wasn't there. So that was the spring that I just left. Okay. So I wasn't there for that one. But uh, we were one game away. We got reverse sweep. We were the start of the reverse sweep meme. Mm. Uh, Curse versus LMQ, summer qualifications. There's no way they don't make worlds. Right. There's no way yeah. they don't make worlds. There was no gauntlet yet. It was just, mm-hmm. you know, you played the third, fourth place match and, and the winner went. Uh, and we were up 2-0, get reverse swept. And that's the start of that meme. And then summer the next year, we, we, we finished there. There's the whole Curse fourth, which isn't even a thing. Yeah. that much. People still kind of bring it up. Yeah. Well, now that they've won four straight championships, ah, it's back. you never know if it's going to yeah. come back. But yeah, and then uh, basically the team did hit rock bottom in 2017. Yeah, that's when it really... Yeah, because the end of 2017 spring was actually the debut of Liquid Doublelift. <laughs> because Doublelift was taking off the 2017 spring split after a disappointing 2016 Worlds with TSM. Wins a few games with them later in the year, gets them through the promotion tournament yep. to avoid relegation. Then 2017 summer, since franchising is happening anyway or permanent partnerships, the four and 14 liquid that had, I'll just list some names that are kind of still around. They had Lorlo at one point, Rainover, Anori, Dardock, Golden Glue, Slushy, Mickey Piglet, Matt Conquan, just like throwing whatever they could to try and win games. Yeah, it was it was just like... A rotating door of people playing and a lot of them you could just tell were like that's not a good decision but they were just doing anything because they they kind of went all in on the 2017 season with the idea of rain over and right. that was right when he left uh split from Huni for the first time i think yeah yeah if i'm remembering it correctly i think yeah. 2016 he was still with Huni. 2016 20... immortals was him and Huni yeah. just dominating 2017 immortals was like dark was on immortals for a bit then Nick smithy was on immortals yeah and that's when that that weird trade happened because yeah. clg was like last place or something with smithy or he i think he led the league in deaths or something and then, <laughs> and then he and then he left and became amazing again yeah uh, that, we'll that, get into smithy's that's history. for like the clg and immortals podcast yeah, yeah 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 uh so either way they they had some really rocky times between 2016 and 2017 that was probably yeah. the 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 lowest that ever went because we never got relegated while i was there or never had to play in promotion tournament yeah 
uh, and then that kind of happened. And then going to franchising, Steve, I remember, was really worried because mm-hmm. he was like, we're coming off these two horrible years. Right. Like, are they even going to let us in? Yeah, he didn't know how competitive it was going to be for this partnership uh, program with franchising. And so he had this, like, massive presentation he worked on because they had just been getting, you know, kind of non-endemic investing. Mm-hmm. I think that's when, like, the Leonis group and uh, Axiomatic and them started investing right. in them. So they were like, well, if we don't get in. We're just a worthless company <laughs> and my dreams are dead. So he managed to get in and then uh, with that kind of new funding, yeah, go all out. Because fortunately for him, TSM also collapsed at 2017 Worlds. Yeah. So yeah, Liquid is by far the biggest winner of permanent partnerships oh, yeah. without question. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll just do a quick history of like the last two years then. Uh, franchising happens. And because 2017 was bad, Liquid completely just blows up the team. Yep. Everyone's gone. And because four new orgs were coming in, it meant a lot of free agents. And in the process of going for permanent partnership, Steve had basically done better than everyone at acquiring funding. Mm -hmm. So I think much to the chagrin of some other teams, he just bought every player, right? Uh, Basically, Immortals, who was a world's team, who had Cody Sun? You try and flash behind Reckless. Just really, it would have been a, it would have been a quarterfinal Worlds team without one play. Yeah, uh, he signs their whole team, basically, except for Cody Sun. Who he, no, actually, he actually does sign. He Cody signs Sun. Cody Sun. Yeah, he signs everyone except for Flame. Yep, um, because that team was Flame, X Smithy, Poe Belter, Cody Sun, and Ole. Yep, and then he switches out the top lane for Impact. He switches out the AD carry for Double Lift. Yep, who TSM had removed because we'll get into that in the TSM episode. Yep. But basically puts together this incredibly high-priced, what looked like almost superstar roster, Impact, X, Smithy, Pobelter, Doublelift, Ole. And then they go 11-7 and seven and finish fourth. So that was that was the finding themselves period. Mm-hmm. But then they run through playoffs, 3-0s all the way. MSI is weird. Ole benches himself. Oh, God. <sighs> then they don't have a solution to that in summer. They still win summer again. They do another 3-0 finals. They go 3-3 at Worlds. And now we'll get into the next topic I kind of want to talk about, which is what they did between 2018 and 2019 and compared to what that means between 2019 and 2020. Because between 2018 and 2019, they switched out actually two players, mm-hmm. right? They switched out Paul Belter for Jensen because they thought Paul Belter was the weak spot and they switched out Ole for Core JJ, who then immediately went on to an MVPs. But world's results, they were three and three and didn't make it out of group stage. And they were three and three and didn't make it out of group stage. In 2018, they three owed both finals. In 2019, they three two'd both finals. They did make MSI say, finals. The, the one big the one. Very important that everyone overlooks all the time. So I think it was, I think it was an improvement, but just like, the last two years of Liquid, what are some of your reflections on like how big their success was and maybe how they can hope to sustain it? I, I mean, obviously, it was record setting. No one had won yeah. three in a row even prior to them. Uh, I, or maybe TSM did one. TSM had won three in a row at one point. Yeah, I remember it for a long period of time in the NALCS, the history was you get two and then you would lose your third attempt usually or you would yeah. come up short. C- C- C9 got two. TSM got two. T- yeah, TSM won 2016 summer, 2017 spring, and 2017 summer. Yes, yeah, so they, the fir- they were the first ones to break yeah. it. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, but then Team Liquid comes in and, and does the three. Then there's the big setup. Who's going to get more? Mm-hmm. Now Smithy has like some of the most titles in the LCS. Double yeah. has the actual most titles in the LCS. So like, yeah. it's it's been incredibly successful uh, domestically. It's like yeah. the best team in North American history pretty much hands down you can argue other teams have been more dominant in regular seasons and yep. stuff like that like the immortals and tsm rosters uh, from different years but in terms of just winning when it matters no team mm-hmm. has won for longer so yeah they are the best in that the msi result you can point to as one of the best achievements for north america yeah, clg in 2016 also made finals but they didn't beat the defending world champions in the semifinals yep they beat flash wolves flash i think wolves. yeah yep. uh, they had a better group stage and that's kind of why they mm-hmm. clg was able to do well uh you can point to the c9 Two years ago at Worlds. Making it to semifinals. As the other big one. But this is probably, you know, the third best achievement in North American Mm -hmm. international history. So no matter how you you slice it there, it's been uh, basically the most successful team ever in in North American history. Yeah. And this is where the interesting part comes into me because 
they were dominant, almost without trying. Mm-hmm. Kind of reminds me of 2016 to 2017 TSM, who were also dominant, mm-hmm. and then just kind of looked past NA and said we needed to blow it up. But I, I don't think TL blew it up in this sense. They've made no. one change in the offseason. They brought in Broxa for X Smithy an attempt to get better. It, we can we can talk about Broxa versus X Smithy now because so, I, I kind of have mixed opinions on it. I do too. This is actually the number one talking point for me yeah. for, for TL this year is is this actually a good change up? Because yeah. I think they're really different players. Um, and you can kind of find this pretty easily if you just look at like most play champion, Lee and Elise versus Gragas Sejuani and mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that for Smithy. So, you know, Brox has a lot more mechanical of a play style. Uh, but even beyond that, like I was looking at their CSDs, which is not a great metric yeah, for junglers. For junglers it's... But I think what I was looking for is more play style. Mm-hmm. And what I found that was interesting was Broxa has one split with a positive CSD in the last four. Smithy has one split with a negative CSD in the last four. So Smithy is a more intelligent pather, you could argue, or at least more aware of efficiency. Yeah, whereas or Brox more is more playmaking. Just, yeah, X Smithy's more willing to take small wins, whereas Broxa goes for big gank wins. Well, right. And I think, you know, depending on how much you follow Brox's career uh, mm-hmm. for d- listeners, uh, he has actually been somewhat criticized the last year or so yeah. uh, by a lot of uh, analysts and, and commentators. Uh, Kelsey Moser wrote a big article about his pathing and things like that and how it's it's not great. I've heard from behind the scenes people say that, you know, he's a great player, of course, great yeah. attitude and stuff, but he's not always the best about knowing what he, like the team needs from him, which is almost the exact opposite of what you think of from Smithy. Yeah. What do you think of, this is a little bit more just like Twitter sphere and stuff, but what do you think of the post-Worlds tweets on Fnatic? Because I know this was a conversation. So basically, here's the background. When a team loses, oftentimes, like, the leader of the team says, you know, we win and lose as a team. Like, the the leader, in a sense, kind of uh, protects his teammates, right? In this instance, Broxa was getting a lot of flame, right? Yep. Uh, Didn't have a great world championship. There are a lot of early games where you could argue he was more involved. You never know what's going on behind the scenes. So I'm not saying that like, this is absolutely the wrong thing. I do. I find it interesting, but here's the tweet. He said, uh, disappointed about our performance simply wasn't our day to day. I know blame will be thrown towards all individuals, including both myself, my teammates and coaches, but we lost this one as a team. And right now we all fans in the team need to stick together. If you're the one who's getting scapegoated. Yeah. Like unfairly. Can you make this tweet? Should you make this tweet? I think it's fine. I think it's fine. I think it's just like you can see there's something there though. Yeah, well, you're. It's always like a little smoke. There's fire kind of thing. Yeah. Like it's probably grating on him that he's getting blamed, and so he's trying to, you know, move the blame around a little bit. Yeah. But I mean, the the whole fanatic thing that happened this year too. From what I, we were at All Stars. We've talked to okay. LEC players and LEC casters and people. Well, just that they were not a good team from a like yeah. cohesiveness standpoint. Right. Like, it's no surprise I think that Broxa and Nemesis and maybe Reckless too, depending on mm-hmm. what story you've heard, all did not get along great. Right. Um, Hillisong, from what I understand, got along really well. Bwipo, from what I understand, mm-hmm. was just like... Like, got... there's little pockets Yeah, there's like little friendship. groups that form. And Broxa was kind of an odd man out, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they... Jungle is probably the position the most that will get affected by team dynamics. Yeah. And so he had one of his worst years, which was still good, but mm-hmm. not, not... It wasn't... So, peak Broxa, to me, was 2018 Worlds. Yeah. He was one of, if not the best junglers there. And that's what you're hoping to recapture going to Team Liquid. And this is a situation where, like, the Fnatic situation for Broxa clearly wasn't optimal. So this can actually be... A lot of times, people like, European players and fans love to throw shade at European players for coming over to the LCS for money. Like, (laughs) I'm sure he got paid. But this is also a situation where I feel like he can also find an upgrade if things go well Wait, which player was it from europe who said like i get power it. of evil power of evil was yeah. no, no 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 uh someone this split talked about brox's move and oh, was okay. saying like i understand him going because if you're not on g2 or Fnatic, you're not gonna win ah and so if you ever want to go to worlds again or ever want to win a championship mm-hmm. in the short term you know things always change in the long term but in the short term get out of here yeah. <laughs> you know like go to north america and go in there because we're the only two teams that are going to win for the next year yeah 
And uh, so, like, I can understand that mentality even more so than some other players who join, like, I joined new immortals or new, yeah. you know, like, these kinds of... It's like, you're probably not going to win a championship. Mm-hmm. You probably didn't have better prospects. So you you're hoping to build something, but really, it's... Y- yeah. You're being a professional. In that right, sense. exactly. Whereas, Brox is like, I can legitimately go back to Worlds and maybe, if things work out, have a better showing mm-hmm. um, than maybe some of the teams in Europe would have. So, yeah. I can at least see that angle more so for him. Yeah, I agree. Talk about X Smithy for a bit as well. I think that X Smithy is and was very good for Team Liquid. Yeah. In the way that Broxa is a huge playmaker who can find ways to shine, especially when he's on Lee Sin. Like X Smithy, I'd call him a glue jungler. Mm-hmm. He does seem to have some underwhelming performances at Worlds. We hear that he doesn't practice that much. When Fortnite was big, he's, they're even joking about it on stage. I mean, he's an incredible... From my understanding, he's a great gamer in general. He went, he's, he's good at everything. He's good at everything. But he does, from my understanding, play less league than a lot of other people. Yeah, which is not as big of a flag for me as I think it would be for others because I think there's actual value in trying to find a right balance. Well, I, he, I would like it if he played more solo queue. Yeah, he's older. You know, like, yeah. if that's how he avoids burnout, so he's actually still, like mentally engaged by the end of the year that's fine by me yeah and i think beyond x smithy versus broxa the almost like the second biggest question for this team is if they're mentally engaged in the split yeah well that's that's further down my list as well but that's a big question yeah and broxa could be good broxa could be bad but one thing it's going to be is it's going to be different yeah and that in itself can make the team try harder. It's almost good if they run into some early adversity with Broxa. Almost. I mean, they might not even have him at the start of the split. Well, that's what I was, that's what I was making yeah. a face. because like The jury's the still whole, out on... The whole Visa situation. Yeah, I think a lot of LCS players are having some issues with Visas, so the start of the split could end up being a little bit wonky. They released that funny video about Paul Belter dubbing the coach announcement as a jungler to come back so oh, yeah. maybe we say po belter maybe we see mike young like we don't know what we're going to see in week one from this team as of yet but four titles in a row two years of dominance mm-hmm. so splits and titles in years are a little bit interchangeable i'm just going to say two years uh i listened to a podcast with steve kerr on it who's the coach of the golden state yep. warriors and i think oftentimes people really underestimate how hard it is to stay at the top the the first climb is the easy one in comparison. Sometimes you can re- re-energize for defending a title, but like the third or the fourth one where you've been through the motions before and that extra grind to get over the top, you kind of believe deep inside you that it's just going to work out because it has in the past. And that's when someone who's hungrier is going to be able to knock you down. So like if something knocks down TL... I don't even know if it would be X Smithy versus Broxa. I think it would more be, hey, no one won four in a row, let alone five. Like, how hard is that to stay dominant for that long? Yeah, I mean, as much as we were talking about the differences in Broxa and Smithy, they're both good players, mm-hmm. uh, and it's probably not going to be such a catastrophic change because, like, you, you're talking about Smithy's a setup jungler. Feels yeah. like he's where his team wants him to be, whereas Broxa might be a little bit more like, I see an opportunity. I'm going to go do this. But that's probably not going to be like, oh, well, now Doublelift can't lane and Jensen can't lane and and they don't have tons of experience playing together in yeah. mid to late game situations. And that's kind of how last year felt a lot of the time where the team could just kind of win. Mm-hmm by being there and being better. And they didn't yeah. need to push themselves in the first 10 to 15 minutes of the game. Uh, and that's something that will slowly, I think, catch up to people. Oh, and especially, like, this is, like you're saying, the third year of it. Mm-hmm. I'm that's, that's, my set, that's probably my biggest concern just in terms of how they'll do is, is that. I think that they will probably be okay. And yeah. this is more, I guess, of an indictment against the rest of the league. But, like, I'm not that impressed with their competition. I, mean, I thought the competition last year was good for them. Look at their roster. It's it's still loaded. Yeah, it's, it's impact no in the conversation for best top laner, right? Jensen, top three, mid laner. Brox and Smithy, we're talking about them because they're two of the best junglers. You can throw Sven Skarin in there because he won the league MVP yeah. last year. Doublelift has won six of the last seven splits that he's played, and he's been in finals of all seven. And Core JJ was first 
in MVP in spring, and I think second or third in MVP voting in summer. Like their roster is unbelievably stacked. Yeah, so they're still nasty, and then the rest <laughs> yeah. of the league is like, well, their best competition in C9 kind of boomed a little bit. Maybe they'll be better. Maybe they won't. C9 sure. seems to always scrap it out in the end. Uh, but then like TSM is TSM good retooled. on paper, but is it better than TL on paper? N- I wouldn't say so. Yeah, Clutch took him to five games and then only kept Hooney. Yeah, like, there's a <laughs> yeah. lot of stuff. Yeah, it's just like, I'm going to talk about with the so anything teams. can happen in the year, of course. But like just looking at all these names on paper, I'm like, well, I don't see anyone that should beat them on paper. Yeah, I did a uh, kind of call it a wisdom of the crowd power rankings, and it's when you just ask yeah. 15 or 20 people, and actually, that's usually more accurate than an individual's power ranking. Yeah, you ever watch? Uh, yeah, I, I want to be a millionaire or whatever. Like the crowd vote is like always right. Yeah, unless it's like really deep down this like niche question. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I th- I think f- f- 16 of 18 people put TL first. Uh, and it's highly questionable when you're not putting TL first. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and sometimes, you know, it's like that thing where no one wants to be the idiot. So yeah. no one does it, uh-huh. especially like in a public setting that can happen or yeah. like, you know, but. Th- okay, so then uh, what is your percentage chance that they. I'm not going to say win the finals. I'm going to say have the best record at the end of the regular season. Oh, well, that's weird just because of the Visa yeah. thing. Yeah, because these are the things that could maybe start to derail the team. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that could slow them down in spring. Uh, like that, like the burnout, like, you know, gearing up again, all that kind of stuff. I would say it's pretty likely that they're not first in spring in regular season. Yeah, one more thing I want to talk about. Okay. There were two moments last year that could have cost them both titles. And how much would those two moments change our perception of this nearly unquestionable number one power ranking? Spring split, game five, Zven. Mm -hmm. The just mind-boggling Ezreal board clear dying to Skarner. Yeah. Which then, I, I went back and watched the play again, even after he dies. Broken Blade all-ins, impacts Vladimir in top lane, doesn't get kills, doesn't have TP, can't join the fight, Vladimir TP's in, and they have like a 5v3 at Baron. Yeah. If Broken Blade just starts walking down, TL can't do Baron off that pick. That That's one very small thing. And then, the game was still close, and they lost another fight. That's what with people a lot forget. It wasn't like shots. that happened. They lose. It was like yeah. ten minutes later. They finally win. Yeah. So yeah, yeah TSM had a six K gold lead in game five, right before that happened. So hypothetical world, that doesn't happen. You and I were watching on the analyst desk game four of summer split finals when Jensen was on the block. Oh yeah. Uh, brief story there is he distorts in, goes too far, burns his flash. All right, he didn't die. He's out. He's out free. Five seconds later, <laughs> does it again? Does it again? <laughs> gets killed by Braum. Gets Core JJ killed too. It's a five v three, and C nine wasn't willing to fifty fifty the Baron. Mm-hmm. TL was willing to fifty fifty the Baron versus TSM, and Acadian didn't get the smite steal in spring. C 9s not willing to fifty fifty the Baron. They back off. TL eventually wins game four and then game five. Yeah. But when I rewatched it, if if, this is a little bit more of a what if, but, yeah, yeah. but if C9 actually goes for the Baron and they win the 50-50 because there's no way TL's actually killing them off of it, yeah, uh, they, they're, they're, they win summer. So, like, they were they were hairs away from not winning either of those finals. What do you think of that? I don't know. That <laughs> Like, that's how a lot of things go. Like, G2 almost lost to Fnatic. Five game yeah, series twice, twice in summer. Okay. Right? You know, uh-huh. we're, we're talking about them being the best Western team in history, mm-hmm. which I still stand by, but, mm-hmm. like, they had some close calls. And I don't think Fnatic was nearly as good as, as G2. But I think when you scrim a team all year and you play on stage, yep. weird stuff happens. Patriots lose to the Giants. You know, things yeah. happen. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean you should project that going forward. Going forward. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that they still came out on top, doesn't it doesn't scare me too much. I mm-hmm. think it shows that, yeah, they're probably a little weaker than we like to hype them up to be. Yeah, <laughs> you know, but it does show resiliency. It keeps your mind open that, hey, something could happen. Yeah, exactly. Like, I think... And especially as time goes on, the likelihood that that thing happens increases. Like you dodged a bullet there. Mm. Are you going to dodge the next bullet? Are you going to dodge the next bullet? Eventually, one of those is going to going to tag you. And I think maybe this is the year. But then you're more like playing odds than like 
data or you know, not data <laughs> but you know like what your eyes are telling you like my eyes and what i see is like team liquid's going to be the best team yeah but at some point the rain has to end and like do you want to bet on now right it's a pretty good time to bet they're on they're not going to win 15 in a row <laughs> yeah <laughs> like... something's gonna happen when do you think it's gonna happen um any other i know you kind of did a top five of most interesting things yeah so we, we hit a bunch of them i think two things to touch on okay one is a little bit more on the play style I was a little disappointed in Jensen last year. I thought he was okay. really good still, but I didn't mm-hmm. see quite as many like take over the game performances. And we kind mm-hmm. of touched on it like they could sit back a lot. Yeah. And I hope Broxa pushes him to engage in more two v twos in the mid lane because I would say that was maybe one of the weaknesses with Smithy and Jensen mm-hmm. was they were more willing to just kind of like chill and go bot versus yeah. like just scrap it out mid. There's yeah. not many games I remember where they scrapped it out mid too much. I agree. I, I think they were anchored from playing to their strength in 2018. Yeah. And Doublelift even talked about this in a lot of interviews. He said, hey, Jensen's really, really good. We just don't help him. Yeah. So that would be an interesting growth point for this team if they do start playing more through Jensen, who's a, a player who's capable of carrying yeah. big games. Yeah, he's he's super good. I think he's been robbed by MVP a couple times. I think oh, He's been so close. I mean, he. Had, I talk yeah. about this all the time. The the split where he had fifty more kills than the next person. I was like, if that doesn't get him MVP, he's just never going to win MVP. He was one point away. Yeah, like literally one point. He. It was one of those ones where, like, if he doesn't win MVP here, he's never winning because he's never going to have a more individually standout season. Mm-hmm. Um. Anyways, I digress. I think he's he's very capable of yeah. being the number two. He could be a number one on most teams, and he's going to mm-hmm. be a number two on Team Liquid. Yeah. You just need to actually flesh out that number two more with Broxa. Yeah, and they need and in doing so, if they flesh out the number two, they lower double ifs number one a little bit. Yeah. That's just how the game works. Yeah, the resources. And think, and... Yeah, a lot of times people forget that when they play so heavily around bot lane and Jensen, sac- he actually does sacrifice in certain instances. But Yeah. yeah. So then that leads to my, my final one, which is I'm a pessimist, so I have to end on a negative note. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. If Team Liquid fails, and we can define what fails means to you. Doesn't win the split. Okay. We'll talk more about that. But if they fail, do you okay. boom the roster at the end of the year? Oh, you're talking about all and, of 2020. All of 2020. So, I'm not doing another Am I doing another one of these? Okay. I mean, sure. Dude, I'm going to be doing a lot. Okay. <laughs> well, podcast. given that it's just the, the beginning of the team, we don't know yeah. how they're going to look. Okay, it's, so it's we're, maybe a little too forward. So you're trying to forecast what failure in 2020 means. Yeah, what does failure in 2020 mean? And if that happens, mm. is this a roster where, you know, we're talking about how they're the best team ever. Do you do the TSM approach? Because that's what we were saying about TSM for two years was with Doublelift and Pyrrhic since the best team ever. And then they they, they weren't getting mm-hmm. it done at Worlds and they eventually mm-hmm. blew the roster up. Do you ever do that? I, I want to check the contract database. Oh, see because who's available. Because two people can blow up the roster. Yeah. The individual or the GM. Mm-hmm. So, if if Teal wins six in a row, yeah, and doesn't make it at a group stage, yep, you don't count. You got to keep it together. You, you don't count that as a failure. They would count it. You would say it's a failure. Like externally, you'd say it's a failure. Yeah, but I think winning NA is too often taken for granted. I think for the GM, yeah, a hundred percent agree. Yeah. I think the amount that being the best team in the league gives you as an owner is cannot be understated. Like people care about your content, people care about your like, you know, watching your games. They know that you're going to be representing them. Yeah, it is is incredibly important for everything to do with the business. You said there's two people who can blow it up. I think players, yeah. especially a player who has won six in a row, he would just go somewhere else. He would just be like, I, don't know. I believe they signed double it for three years. Okay, so you think this would be his last um, year? I, I mean, I I think I'm actually going to, I'm two seconds away from being able okay, to. Okay, well, I'll stall until you get it. Yeah. I think from the player perspective, if you win six in a row and you're still not finding the international success, and Doublelift has stated a lot publicly that he wants to be the best and, and you know, actually win worlds and do all this stuff, I think he gets a little antsy, but we'll see. Dude, Impact, Brox, at Jensen, Doublelift, Core, JJ, all 2020 at the end of the year would be up for contract or no. Ooh, boy. So this this is the make-or-break year for this iteration of TL. That's, I, th- that's I think you I, can say it. I think that's how I feel because, yeah. like, I understand if Steve could re-sign all those players after winning six in a row and go, let's yeah. go for eight. You know, of yeah. course, he would probably do it and yeah. maybe look for a little upgrade here or there if he can swing them. But I think for, for the players, I think du- Double If would, would have to take a yeah. you know, I, long, I, hard look. In order for this team, it's it's weird. 
I value titles highly. And Steve values titles highly too. When they won their first title in 2018, that was like a life affirming moment. Yeah. uh, That all this work was worth it. And for Impact, remember? Like even Impact, a world champion was like really happy to win his first NA title back in 2018 spring. But when he won four in a row, if you won five in a row, if you won six in a row, like they, for the individuals, they end up meaning less. And then you start wanting the things that you haven't accomplished yet. Yep. So even if this team is like, oh, they lose a close final in spring and then third place in summer, but they make it to Worlds, but then they make it to semifinals, they'd actually probably be feeling pretty good about themselves. I th- yeah, I think, weirdly enough, yeah. fans and players, or the, the players on the team, would feel better about that than they would feel if they had won two more titles, had a mediocre MSI performance, and then busted out in groups again at Worlds. I think... You know that would just frustrate fans because then you're saying our best team can't even cut it, and like the yeah. narrative becomes so sour. Versus, oh, they struggled a little bit domestically because they're bored. You know, yeah. maybe you can spin it like that. And then when they got to the international stuff, they were great. That reminds me, really quickly, of like I hated it, uh, but I was a football fan who followed the San Diego Chargers. This is like ten or fifteen years back when they had Marty Schottenheimer as their coach. Okay. Yeah. Uh, basically, they were gods in the regular season. This was with LD, right? Like, yeah, the LD. I think this was like his 30 touchdown season. Yeah, yeah. And I think they were 14 and 2 in the regular season and lost their first playoff game. And they're like, "Marty just can't get it done in the playoffs. Like, <laughs> we got to switch out and get a new coach." You're 14 and 2. You're the most dominant football team uh aside from the playoffs. And then you lose in the playoffs and you're like, "Well, we got to get a coach who wins in the playoffs." Next year, they go like 9 and 7. Right, like the start of the season is a mess because uh, they switched up the coach. I can see the guy's face. I can't remember his name though. Yeah, I apologize for the true football historians. Uh, I I know him too. He was an offensive coach. Yeah, I, I can see yeah. his face. I just yeah, he was an offensive coach who like preached the passing game. Anyway, they go to the AFC Championship game after going nine and seven. Uh, but Phil Rivers like tears his ACL and plays on it against the Patriots or something, and they don't make it. Yeah. But anyway, it was like this weird juxtaposition. Marty Schottenheimer built something so great that didn't succeed in that like highest pressure moment. And then like the next year they didn't even make the playoffs. Like they were clearly on a downward trajectory, but like they just did better in the playoffs with the new system. And that was kind of looked at as a success. So in the same way, I think for TL, uh, we've been over it, but uh, highest expectations by far of all the TL teams. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for joining me. That's TL. It was a lot of fun. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I am Joshua Jatt Leesman, joined right now by David Freak Turley. Puns of damage. That's his voice. That's yep. his apparently saying of the last 10 years. And last seven. Last seven. Okay, really? I feel like puns of damage was longer ago. I mean, I feel like tons of damage was like the original, oh, like, whatever, right. like, welcome to the League of Legends champion spotlight. Featuring Garen, the might of Demacia. Right. Was that the first time you said tons of damage? Uh, it was one of the ones that I used it too much. I remember there being like three of them within the thing. Yeah, you definitely overused it at some point. Yeah. And then it became a meme. But you yeah. don't remember the first time it was I don't. in the script. But it, it was certainly it was certainly champion spotlights, and it was because I wanted to like invoke a sense of how damaging the ability was, but I've never wanted to include numbers in a kit because it would always change. So I was like, okay. well, a Garen ultimate oh. does tons of damage. <laughs> you know, something else does massive damage. And, you know, just like I was trying to find subjective ways of quantifying. <laughs> That's where it came from. Yeah, lots of damage. Yeah. A bit of damage. It, it was an intent yeah. to inform. Then it became a meme, tons. which I'm happy about. Okay. Anyway, with that tangent, we're on to Golden Guardians for 2020. And like for all of these teams... I wanted to start with a brief history of how the team got to their current state, especially because I never know how long an LCS fan has been watching the LCS, especially like when I walk in, when I meet a fan on the street or something, sometimes it's amazing. Oh yeah, I watched in 2014 and then I stopped for three years and then I watched last split, right? It's all this mixed information. So the Golden Guardians team came in during permanent partnership in 2018 and the road hasn't been great. No. Their 2018 was basically, it might have been the worst ever for a team that couldn't get relegated. Yeah. Because they they back-to-back 10th. In LCS, I think, and Academy. Like, it was was like they just signed the actual worst players. At least relative to to the rest of the league. Right? Like, even their subs weren't good enough. Yeah. 
I don't know why. This is definitely something I should have done research on beforehand. Had there ever been a team that finished 10th twice and won the promotion tournament both times? Because you would have been in the promotion tournament prior to permanent partnership. Right. But also, part of their their pitch and part of the pitch for permanent partnership is it is okay to be 10th as long as you're working towards something. And yep. that was actually what Golden Guardian's original message was, is that they were going to try and invest in young NA talent. Mm-hmm. And build from there. So their initial roster was high in the mid lane, who was going to coach all these young kids with potential. Their their first roster was Lorlo, Contracts, High, Deftly, and Matt. Yeah. And you can tell that didn't work because none of those players built and stayed on that team. That's true. And what's sad is, for several of those players, like, it's close. Like, I'm still a fan of Lorlo. I think he's a good player. He hasn't mm-hmm. quite managed to remain LCS caliber. I mean, contracts bounced around for a while afterwards. He was clearly, at yeah. least teams thought, LCS caliber. Yeah, I mean, like, he was on the team longer than anyone. Yeah. He was even on—he made playoffs with the team right. eventually in 2019 spring. Exactly. So, like, you know, he's actually pretty solid. Um, I think he's, he's what, lcs list this year around. But I he's think on he the can, academy team, yeah. Yeah, but, but I think, like— that that can still work, right? He's incredibly mm-hmm. young, obviously, and and I mean, definitely. Okay, you can joke about it a bit. Played at Worlds last year. Uh, I mean, hey. Cloud Nine brought him along, but yeah. like, definitely is a pretty solid player. Also, now, yeah. okay, sure, you ended up kind of hitting two out of five with that. Mm-hmm. Like, ultimately, yeah. And you, whenever a team says young talent, you're you're not expecting them to hit on a hundred percent of young talent. That's just not how talent development works. Yeah, of course, right? So, uh, 2018 was a bit of a disaster, but. In 2019, they pivoted a bit. They actually brought in some experienced players. They brought in Hanser, Froggen, and Ole. Yeah. And they made it to playoffs and made it to a fifth game in the quarterfinals. So kind of look back and say FlyQuest's quarter or semifinal run was their crowning achievement of 2019. Mm -hmm. Golden Guardians had it a little bit, and then they missed playoffs barely in summer with an 8 and 10 record after doing a lot of bottom lane shuffles. Yeah. Do you think that was like a, a... I think it was a decent progression for Golden Guardians. Like, they started so poorly yeah. that if that would have happened two splits in a row, then really you would have just said, well, what what is going on here? Like, at least I can give them a little bit of benefit of the doubt sure. for what happened 2019. And you got my, any thoughts yeah. on that? Yeah, so my 2019 read is like, keep in mind, this was this was picking up Ole right after you won with Team Liquid. Now, yeah. certainly TL went and upgraded the core JJ, but, like, I'm trying to, like, put the right thoughts ahead about Ole. Because, obviously, we saw his 2019 season. was like, okay, he's clearly not all that good. Yeah. And there was the weird mishap at MSI where, like, he benched himself because he was underperforming. In so, like, okay. Yeah. The, right, right. When he was on Team Liquid, right? So, like, mm-hmm. you knew there was this weird damage to the goods, like, coming in. But it, it still felt like 2019 was, was Golden Guardian saying, okay... You know the development isn't happening. We need we need to shell out and like and like buy a real team, and and it worked right. Like they got playoffs yeah. the first split. Not a lot of teams get playoffs first split. Like like I'll I'll count twenty nineteen spring as successful yeah. as you threw a new roster together. You replaced most of the players and you hit more than you missed and you found a top sixteen. Uh, but it's like you you found players that like I don't know. I'm not super high on Froggins. It's mm-hmm. like I don't know. You grab this guy, but like he hasn't done well in NA and I mean literally ever. Like Ole like. This guy benched himself at an international tournament mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. he couldn't handle the pressure. Like, if you have aspirations of being really good, like that, that's never going to work. And and so, uh, like, I'm happy they did well, but like, so much of those memories are like, ooh, but like, you went there. 2019 spring was the one split of LCS ever that I didn't cast because I was on the game design team for the first seven months of the year. And when I look back at the standings. It is a little bit shocking. It, it, we were talking about this just before the show. We got TL, Cloud9, and TSM all at 14 and 4 or 13 and 5. Then there's this other crew of FlyQuest, Golden Guardians, and Echo Fox. Yeah. And those were the playoff teams. And then you have CLG, Optic, Clutch, 100 Thieves all missing. It's like the top was the top, the most established brands we've seen. But then it's like the middle and the bottom were just flipped for a split. Yeah. Right? Compared to what kind of normal expectations are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just... it's it, Again, it's it, this one split of LCS where I didn't watch all of the games and I was focused on different things. But when I look at it, it's just kind of shocking because it was like a blip. We go into summer and it's back to normal again, right? Because we have 
CLG making playoffs. We have Ruin on third team. We have like CLG kind of being good again. Right, right. The top four is the top four again. I mean, it's weird to me because like CLG, like throughout their entire like org history, is like always a fifth ish place team, plus or minus two, except for those two splits they won. Because sure, I think sure, that sure. like, right, like back in the Devil era, they hit relegation like three times. Like, like, like CLG to me is like a playoff bar team and then just variations from there because they've been here so long. They've, they've done the high and the low. Uh, I mean, 100 Thieves aside from the, the, the 2018 split. <laughs> well, they had the split. 2018 and 2019 and they're like different stories. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, you anchor yourself on 100 Thieves being good because yeah, of their very first split right. in the Afro MVP in the finals where they got completely slaughtered. Um, you know, thanks for buys. Uh, but like the rest of 100 Thieves run is also like, well, you benched all the wrong players and... and <laughs> We're going to a random team. Yeah, we're going like, to a different team. But, but you're bringing up all these history points, right? I'm yeah. like, but here's how I view it, like being in it, where it's like, I fell off a lot of these things really fast. Yeah. Okay. So moving into 2020, yeah. Golden Guardians has gotten off the Frog and Train. Yep. And they're on the GGGG train. Yes. Quad G. I am happy about that. Yeah. So just Golden Guardians mm-hmm. has changed their tri code to GG instead yep. of GGS. So. Golden Guardian. Uh, he did, I mean, <laughs> it never made sense for them to have an S. Actually, yes, I actually agree with you. Yeah, I'm like, why are you mocking this? Yeah. I actually think it's the right choice. But now, Golden Glue on Golden Guardians is yeah. like the perfect combination. But I will argue, and I'll talk about this in the Dignitas episode later. Froggen was actually really good for the team. That's true. He, and yes, he is a player that traditionally overvalues laning phase, and that is to his detriment. But that doesn't mean. He isn't still really good in lane. That's true. He had the best CSD of all players in spring split for mid lane, and he was still top three in summer split for CSD stats. And it, it's not like his kill participation was completely lacking either. He had high kill participation numbers near like the top four in kills. Like he was he was performing yeah. in the mid lane, and they had this revolving door down bottom lane, especially in summer split when they're putting who he down there with yeah. FBI and then they're switching out between definitely this everyone they ran in the bottom lane trying to solve it. Yeah. And like I wanted I wanted like the who he experiment. Like the idea of hey let's let's convert someone to support, right? Who he's like, well I can't mm-hmm. hack as a mid laner. I want to go jungler support because he's like the map awareness roaming guy and those are the roles for that. I think almost more than mid. Mm-hmm. And you know here's Golden Guardians who are willing to pick up on the experiment. Like I'm there's so many experiments for Golden Guardians, right? Like yes. every every year, it's like, yep, yeah, we're gonna right, we're gonna import the O's talent, you know, we're gonna we're gonna bring Huhio in, in the support. We'll pick him up for that because the support pool is pretty limited. And NA spoiler alert, they did that again with Keith. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, it, it's such a weird history where it's like, wow, they keep trying things that other teams aren't trying. Like yeah. every year, every split, Golden Guardians has something like that. Yeah. So let's get into 2020. Okay. Because Froggen's out, contracts is out. They brought in Closer, who was a TCL player, who was actually at Worlds last year, yep. has played with Broken Blade, played with Armut last year, who ended up actually being also one of the best players in all the TCL. Whenever there is, for me, whenever there is a player who, or sorry, a jungler player who coincidentally plays with really high performing solo laners, I always want to give more of the credit to the constant. Because Broken Blade was like the best player in the TCL and then he gets picked up by TSM. And last year at Worlds when I was prepping Royal Youth, which was Armut's team in the TCL, when they went 16-2 and and went to Worlds, he just dominated that league. So there's something there, I feel like, in terms of a jungler who might end up being really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's something we'll make sure we touch on later. So I'll just run down the whole Golden Guardians 2020 roster. Hans are still in the top lane. Closer is the jungler from the TCL. Golden Glue has been acquired in a trade from Cloud9. They mentioned, uh, it, you know, it was a trade. They had a video where they're just like listening to the actual ESPN show when they acquired him. This is also when they had this whole support thing, which we'll get to. FBI is their starting ADC next year. And Keith is their yep. starting support. Yep. That is the biggest thing that jumps out on the page to me as a chance to just collapse the whole thing. Sure. We got a chance to talk to Golden Glue literally 10 minutes before this because he was here for asset, asset Day where they're taking photos. Yep. And Golden Guardians made a roster swap announcement video. 
And they ended up actually revealing a lot. I, I don't know if this is exactly the type of content you want to be able to ship, especially if it doesn't go wrong. But right. I, I'll give a recap of what happened. Basically, they tried to do a behind the scenes of Free Agency Day, and it was Hakuho who they were going for in the video. And they said, oh, we didn't get Hakuho. And also, their coach said, oh, Hakuho is definitely top five. There's one thing they mentioned in the video. And they showed this screen cap of supports on teams for sure. It has Zazel, Vulcan, Biofrost, Core JJ, Smoothie, and Ignar. Those are the teams that they know are on teams. And then there are kind of four unsigned supports. And they do this behind the scenes conversation where they say, you know, actually, we don't think any of the supports available are good. We can make a better support by converting an AD to support. Is that, that that's like the kind of good spin on it. Do you think that is true? That Zazel, Vulcan, Biofrost, Core, JJ, Smoothie, Ignar. Mm -hmm. After that. Just bring in Keith. Keith is the best, like hat in, in a couple months can be the best support. Aphromoo exists, but I could see why they wouldn't want to bring him in after their experience of bringing in older players. Uh, sure. And they're kind of moving away from Frog and even on that, or they moved away from high early on. I can understand. Let's just not even consider Aphromoo. Like, the rest of the pool, like rather than... So th I think the short answer is no. That That is not an accurate statement. Okay. Um, one of the reasons is um, because they have what would otherwise be a fairly open import slot uh, with FBI in the starting roster, mm -hmm. right? Um, you can find a domestic AD carry combined with an import support that is for sure better than FBI Keith. Like, at, at least on paper, right? right? And look, there is a chance these guys are actually amazing, and I'll be happy for them. Like, I don't want to see those two players fail, but on paper, there is no reason this bot lane should be good. Mm. If it is, awesome. Again, yeah. I will be happy for them. I am a Golden Guardians fan. I like a lot of the players in that roster. I like a lot of the, the, the staff of that team. But there is a Chinese support player out there that could be scouted and brought over, and it's, you know... Like, yeah, better than both those players combined. Teams really haven't liked importing the support role. It's like they'll yeah. support mid laners or sorry, import mid laners, occasionally ADCs, but it's like soul lanes. It seems to be like the number one thing that yep. they end up bringing in. I agree. Th this is the thing that to me could could just derail everything. But there's yes. there's some other stories on the team that would give me confidence. Uh, yeah, like so. Golden Glue is a player who has been around for a really long time. Yes. And personally, it's a player who I really want to see succeed. Me too, Jet. Yeah. He debuted in the LCS in the 2014 spring split. Yes. With Team Dignitas. Filled in for Scara? Or... Filled in for Scara. Yep. Uh, played Orianna. Uh-huh. Got a quadra kill. <laughs> <laughs> missing all of his spells. While missing a shockwave. He whiffed his shockwave at the start of a dragon fight and then picked up a quadra kill and was actually statistically the worst mid laner in the LCS yeah. that year. Yep. He, sure, he had that highlight moment to start, but like his CS numbers, his damage numbers. No debate from me. He was bad. Yes, agreed. He was a starter for Team 8 in 2015. He played on Team Liquid for periods of 2015 summer. He was in Challenger in 2016 for Team Liquid. Occasionally, an LCS player for TL in 2017 when they're a total mess oh, and yeah. in the promotion tournament, oh, like constantly with midlit. And then the redemption arc kind of started. Like, think of almost any other pro player that we know of that existed between 2014 and 2017 and had the type of poor results that Golden Glue had. Mash, they're gone. Yeah, I mean, Mash is still going for it. So, yeah, like, it's if, true, right? If right. Mash has a redemption. And I, I like him too. Yeah, okay. From from, yeah. from the idea of the wrench mark. Like I don't know him super well as a person, yeah. but yeah. Um everyone else is at a league. I agree, yes. But he's he's persistent. Yep. Right? And then his redemption arc started. In twenty eighteen, he played for C nine in summer when they were having all of those roster issues because Reaper was really pushing the use of substitutes. Mm -hmm. So he played a little bit in the regular season, didn't do that well. But in against TSM in the LCS semifinals, they were elimination game. They sub in Svenskeren and Golden Glue. He pops off. They make finals. Yep. That was that was peak Golden Glue. <laughs> yes, it was. Right there. Someone in an interview was like, oh, man, he's like Faker and Scrims. It was just yeah, it yeah, was yeah. absurd uh, yeah. compliments to him. 
that's, and that's what I base my entire opinion of Golden Glue on. By the way, the like I am aware, Peter. I am aware yeah. he has like a six-year history <laughs> in the LCS. However, mm-hmm. other than 2019 spring where he played two games and lost to Clutch, 2018 playoffs, yeah, he popped off against TSM, and that's where I anchor my opinion of Golden Glue. Great mid laner, and the. <laughs> Literally a week later, yes, he's subbed in in game two of the finals. Yeah, he is solo killed at level two by Pope Belter. Yep, <laughs> and he never <laughs> starts for them again. Uh, no, he does a little bit. He played two games two, in spring. He played and two games. Yeah, exactly, two games in spring in 2019, and then Niski played the rest of the year. I actually thought that last year for Golden Glue was going to be a really big opportunity for him to step up as a starter, right? They lose Jensen. Golden Glue was already there. I'm like, okay, yeah. they brought in Niski, but surely they're going to keep up the same thing. And then Niski was just the guy. Yep. Yeah. So that was a little shocking to me. He didn't end up going to Worlds with them uh, and then traded to Golden Guardian. So now at least he has his chance to start. Like, it's a ride. I- I'm always going to wonder what really happened in 2019. I don't know if you have any theories on that. Uh, but now yeah. he'll he'll have he'll have a shot. In the sense of, like, him never starting? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, again, I was I was in the same boat, right? 2019, I was like, okay, like Team Liquid spent a whole bunch of money and, and bought Jensen from you. I'm I'm pretty sure, yeah. um, or the contract ran out, but I forget. Either either way, he's gone. I was like, okay, this is the time. Like, Reaper clearly played Grayson for like a third of the split. Like, he's mm-hmm. got to be ready. It's time to go. Uh, and and then yeah, just just out of nowhere, it's like, no, you're gonna play two of the like. 37 games your team plays that year and and it's actually just all Niski the whole time also you're not going into the sub and Niski ended up being the biggest liability on c9 at worlds that year which is oops um yeah. and okay they finally sold him off so now golden glue gets a starting spot mm-hmm. um yeah i mean the answer to your question of like do you have any theories i got nothing yeah. right like it, it's pure speculation with no like nugget of information to mm-hmm. like the blossom that off of so True. like guess they didn't think he was good enough but yeah and like maybe that's true, right? Like again, I'm I'm being really rose tinted in my view of Golden okay. Blue, right? You but you bring up the like yeah. getting solo killed in the finals. I mean, they were already losing the series. It was like, wow, they're just getting clapped by TL. Yeah, we'll just throw players in, and oh, none of the combinations work. Like, well, yeah, because TL is better than you. Um, but I mean, ultimately, uh, high hopes for Golden Blue. Uh, I optimistically put him as like the number five or six mid laner. This is optimistic, yeah, but I, so I think I was you gonna, can swing that. I'm glad you brought that up yeah. because I have the list of starting mid laners. We've got Jensen, Niski, Crown, Bjergsen, Froggen, Poe, Ryoma, Jazuki, Jazuke, yeah. Ika, and then Golden Glue. You have them around yep. six. Yep. So, so, uh, so yeah. Jensen put above. Niski put above. Yep. Um, Bjergsen put above. Crown put above. Yeah. Golden Glue. Okay. I put so, him over Poe. And so I put you're him gonna over say the... it's an upgrade from Froggen. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And and I know Froggen's good, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and some of this is, is twofold. Like, the, like there is some internal value of not being an import. So you can bring in a better jungler, right? right. Like if Frog has a roster, closer can't come in and, mm. and mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. that's an upgrade, right? Mm-hmm. So, so like some of that goes to golden glue just for that reason. Like, like, you know, in, in the realistic world of putting an NA, uh, putting an LCS roster together, import status does matter. Uh, but I can like. There, this split could end, and Golden Glue could have overall better spots than Froggen, um, and and I can see that like yeah. reasonably happening. I'll give that. So I am someone who is actually more sold on Team Dignitas's roster than most. Mm-hmm. So I have at this point a slightly higher opinion of Froggen than others. So I'll say I kind of think this is a bit of a downgrade, but I can also understand why they did it, especially if closer is good. Yeah, they had the video of him meeting at he basically met the team at all-star because he was an all-star so he yep. got to go to vegas and then golden glue went there to meet him and like hang out uh, it was a pretty funny video because closer all-star this year was his first time in the u.s and golden glue kept talking and telling him hey just this is not what the u.s is like oh yeah it's las vegas <laughs> yeah. this is his, very his, different his, his first impression of the u.s is just this extravagant city oh yeah that's open all the time with people drinking and partying just ridiculous there's like 300 lumens of light at all times from all the billboards yeah uh so let's i want to kind of close out with closer in okay. the jungle top kind of top half of the map with mm-hmm. Hanser because as we mentioned before he is a 21-year-old jungler 
He played with Broken Blade in the TCL. He went 16-2 and in the TCL summer with Armut, who was the top laner, who again had amazing stats. There's a lot of reason to believe he was the big fish in the small pond of yeah. the TCL. And I feel generally like imported players from non-major leagues, when they're at the top of their game, often end up being some of the better investments. Rather than taking like a middle of the pack player from the LCK, take the top, top of the pack player from a minor region and that'll work. We'll see how that works with like Rioma for 100 Thieves. Yep. Uh, it was kind of what happened with Broken Blade. It is what happened with Closer. It's kind of what has been attempted with FBI. So I can see Golden Guardians is looking in the same vein. Yeah. And it's what TL's trying with with Shurnfire, right? He's going to be on Academy, but yep. they're like, hey, this is the next one you can try. Like, you know, get this guy up there, you know, fix him up from, from being toxic. Uh, we saw Ruin. Uh, right. This was this was mm -hmm. just last split. This was CLG's choice, and you know, came in for Darshan and uh, number three all league top laner. And I mean, basically zero LCS fans have heard of him up until well, he went to MSI, mm -hmm. uh, and CLG signs him, and he's actually the reason they get back in a playoff form and, and nearly make worlds. I mean, they won third place. Uh, so yeah, the, the, like there is a proven track record of this kind of thing working. Uh, so I am through that because like it doesn't really matter the games you watch it. It is hard to tell how good the player actually is from watching TCL. Yeah, and uh, just just really quickly, for I was a little bit confused when he said it. Ruin, even though he is a South Korean player, was last playing in the TCL before right. he joined COG. Right. Yeah. yeah. So so using that as litmus test, like, well, he was here, mm -hmm. and then look, it worked out. Uh, but you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Hanser plus closer. I thought Hanser was really good in 2019. So so best case for mm -hmm. Golden Guardians. The jungle top synergy works really well. This is a top focused team, actually. Golden Glue plays the utility kind of shock collar type jungler, and then then Keith and FBI don't derail the whole thing because that's a yes. that's a just giant red flag. Yep, in the ground down there in the bottom lane that I have to worry about as I hit one of our soundboards that no yeah. one no one heard. No, I didn't. That didn't was fall. A We're good. So yeah. I did a, I mentioned this with every team, I did a, a wisdom of the crowd power rankings where I asked like 16 or 17 different people who follow the LCS. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the aggregate average, Yep. I think I just used average twice. The mean. Yeah, it was 9.1. Yeah. So that out, out actually that actually puts them in 10th. Yeah. Do you agree? Because I, uh, I, think I, I had, had them at 8 or 9. Yeah, actually, I can, I can look yeah. up yours right now. Yeah. Yeah, you I, had them at 9th. Yeah. Stand by that. Ultimately, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think this team is high variance. Like to, to me, I always like to think of teams and players in terms of like a bell curve, and you anchor mm -hmm. it on a point, and it's a wide or a narrow bell curve, um, right? Like I anchor Hanser around like number four or five top laner, um, fairly narrow bell curve. He's like about that good. Right. Um, closer, I will put it fourth, but very wide. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll put it more like five or six and very wide. Um, Golden Glues, you know, five or six, pretty narrow, and then you know I put FBI and and Keith at the tenth place bottom lane, but like, this is with a huge question mark. I've literally never seen Keith play support before. Yeah. Uh, when they were doing in Korea, they hit a few hundred LP. Like yeah. they weren't, you know, top fifteen challenger. This is not the best, you know. Bot I heard lane. they made about like five hundred LP, which right. is which for a guy who has played support for two months. Yeah. Not the worst. Right. So they're decent, yeah. right? But you know, doing makes your elo better, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. Like you get to communicate with that guy, so you can play the lane together. So they're. There is zero chance they're as good as Double F Corte J. Yeah. I mean, like actually zero. Yeah. Now, no dub, but but like you know, weird things happen. Wait like, until they get the two v two solo kill right. that proves definitively they're better. No, but that's like not Golden Glue. So I think solo killed Bjergsen in their their yeah. semifinal run, mm -hmm. right? So like mm -hmm. Golden Glue can do that. Keith and FBI cannot outlane Corte J and Double Lift, like yes. just physically, right? So you know that variant that that edge of the variance doesn't exist. Again, their, their mean still sits at 10, 10 or 9 in that bottom lane. Yeah. And that is where it comes down, right? Yeah. I think most of this roster is playoff caliber um, and and maybe even semifinals caliber, right? Like, I think, like, you know, the high end of this team would be top four okay. um, on a good day. But that's if their bottom lane is at their top 5%, right. right? They're like, actually, they're a serviceable bot lane. And that, I think, is really unlikely. Who he could come in, who he's on the roster. He True. wasn't great last time around, yeah. but he is a domestic player. Yeah. Um, uh, like he counts for that. So I don't think that's necessarily an upgrade over Keith anyway. Like, he was already pretty mediocre sure. as it stands. So so this is the thing where it's like, well, this really brings down the average. Yeah. And 
I agree. I put them at 10th because someone has to go 10th. Sure. When I look at the overall power rankings of the leagues, the closest I'll put to playoff lock would be TLTS MC9. Those are like the top three. Yeah, that's mine. After that, there's a lot of fluidity. So I'll give this throughout the episodes, but like the wisdom of the crowd then has CLG, Hunter Thieves, EG, all kind of in the middle of pack with high variance. That's my next three. Yeah, followed by Dig Immortals, FlyQuest, Golden Guardians. Right. Yep. That's how that's how it all goes out. Yeah. Golden, Golden Guardians has the biggest flags for me, yeah. which ends up putting them at 10th. But if we do best case, worst case, worst case actually is 10th. Best case, I'd, I'd agree. It is not unthinkable that they're a playoff team because yeah. they literally were a playoff team in 2019 spring split. And theoretically, when GMs and teams are making moves, they're trying to upgrade their team. So in yep. good faith, like they tried to improve from that moment. Jun- jungle's better. Bot lane, probably not. Mid lane's close-ish. Yeah. I know you think Frogging's better. I-, I think it's close. Yeah. But jungle difference should make that look better. I'm excited to see this team play just because as someone who's been in the LCS since the start of it, seeing Golden Glue pop up on a team, Hell right? Yeah. He's been around since 2014. Even Keith, I think one of the first standalone pieces of content I did was this, I think we did three episodes of Jat 22. It was this, oh, it was like this single camera show with That's the right, screen yeah. in the top right. I remember that. And I was saying, who should TSM start? Keith or Turtle? <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> like they were winning with Keith, but Turtle's clearly the better player. Yeah, right? But everyone was like having this debate. So he's another guy who's been around for a super long time. Yeah. And then Hauntzer obviously is kind of an old fan favorite from TSM. So like if this team does well, I think fans will immediately get behind them. But we'll, we'll have to see. Any any final thoughts about Golden Guardians? Final thoughts. Uh, I'm going to move my power rank to seventh. I think they can. I, <laughs> that like, was a big jump. Well, I mean, the thing is, again, that like there's the very clear top three, the very clear yeah. next three, and the very clear bottom four. I'll just put okay. it at the top of the bottom four. Okay. That, like there is a gap, and I think it's big between EG uh, or CLG, who's like my five, six, yeah. um, and Golden Guardians. But the upside is there, right? The yeah. upside of winning quarterfinals in, you know, 2% of all seasons exists. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, We'll see. I I, I hope Bottling can do well. I have high hopes for Golden Glue. I have high hopes for the top side of the map. Uh, if if they do well, it's through those three players. Yeah. And I think all those three players are very good. Like mm-hmm. we will see that happen. Mm-hmm. And if like no one bans Victor or sorry, if no one bans um Varus and FBI can From just FBI. play his yeah. one champion, <laughs> he's fine. Like he's he's gonna be all right. And just like I don't know, Keith can just land him out of ganks and and they'll just chill to not lose bot lane. Uh, early dragons aren't as powerful. So you yeah. can actually lose bot lane. Uh, like plates are also worth less gold. Mm-hmm. So like getting clapped in bot lane means less than in previous seasons. That, like mm-hmm. objectively, just through the game design, getting clapped in bot lane means less than last season. So it is less of a liability than if it was twenty nineteen. Ooh, that's that's like that's a, its own discussion. I that's realize, its own discussion. But I'm also willing to have that discussion. I, feel like it, I, I don't know need, how long the episode's going. I feel like I need to comment. I was about to wrap it up, but we okay. can do we can do whatever we want. It's just the two of us. So. You're the guy to talk about with Dragon Souls. Okay. And maybe it's it's whole separate podcast where we just talk about the game changes. But for now. Yeah. Early Drakes are less powerful. Yes. But they become a late game win condition. Yes. So we've only seen 10 LPL games. We haven't kind of seen the pro consensus on this yet because you can start the Dragon Soul Wars so early if you focus yeah. the Drake. But there's also that chance that you deprioritize early drakes, you play towards topside, they keep buffing Rift Herald, they just got buffed again, yep. it's easier to take, mm-hmm. and kind of run down those early plates and then contest Drake drakes three and four, Yeah. right? Because I think early on in the season, the, the dragons were overtuned, so they were weaker dragons that were also just as strong as the old buffs. Now they're weaker buffs because yep. the dragon soul is so powerful. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm going to be really fascinated in how that works the other thing that i'm going to be interested in is if the jungle is actually a weak role because mm. it's it's weaker than it was last year objectively in terms of how strong the jungler can be late game now yeah you get level three faster so sure. your early impact has the potential to have more influence but later in the game you're less of a factor yeah unless you and i don't think this is viable in pro play probably not. Yeah. maybe you know like theoretically if you are taking your camps on cooldown there is more golden xp per minute that is that is that is a pure fact that like sure like again this this is a very big if it's like yeah. if keith is a good support it's like 
If you can power farm, there is objectively more gold. If you only clear camps every two and a half minutes, there is objectively less gold in XP. Okay. And that is the likely situation yeah. we are in in pro play. Mm -hmm. There's like a few a small things that like, well, if this happens, like Gromp is strictly a better camp than last year. Yep. And it respawns faster. So yep. like, well, if you just keep ganking the Gromp side of the map, then mm -hmm. you're really good. This was why, for example, people would say um, red team can play around top side, not just because counter pick, but because the jungler wants to sit on Krugs all the time. Yeah. Red side Krugs are by top lane. Um, okay. Well, now red side Gromp is by bot it's lane. Almost, and, it's, and, it's almost overcompensated. Like right. Krugs still take really long. Don't give that much of reward. Right. Single target junglers are better. Yeah. And so those kinds of things, right? Where it's like, well, it turns out actually if, if I'm always doing Gromp on cooldown, yeah. that is way more XP and gold than last mm. season. And if that's part of my 2020 jungle pathing, I can make up some of that difference. Some of, again, I'm not saying that you're definitely stronger, yeah. but that is a learning that needs to happen. Yeah. 2019 jungling is weaker in 2020. 2020 jungling must be different in some way. Yeah. It probably involves camping your Gromp camp or something. Um. And again, if, if you're actually playing Shivana, you're actually just better than last year. These are very sure. narrow things, yeah. right? To to be clear, and that means that it probably is weaker. Like that's still my answer: is it yeah. probably is weaker? But, the, but yeah, the TLDR is if bottom lane is less influenced than last year, that's probably good for the guardians. Yes, right. That because is the solo lanes that. are probably more important, and that could theoretically benefit them. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll accept that. Yeah. As a as a statement, I think it's true. Yeah. Uh, th thanks for coming on. Thank you for, for having me. Uh, Golden Guardians 2020. I'm excited to see their first game, but we'll have to see. Have to see.